Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for joining the panel today. We're talking about investing in identity, um, themes and trends ahead. Now, I, I know from previous conversations, this conversation is going to go much broader than that. So I'm excited about the next 45 minutes we have in front of us. Uh, one, just one point to make for, for the audience out here. This is while this is recorded ahead of time, we are going to be live for the Q&A session. So please make that interactive. The, part, the panelists will be on the Q&A answering questions you might have. So we're hoping for an engaging conversation here. Um, so let's get started. By way of introduction, my name is Monty Gray. I am the Senior Vice President of Corporate Development here at Okta, which includes multiple different multiple things, including Okta Ventures. And here, let's introduce the panelists. So why don't I first turn it off to turn it over to, to Lon. Hi, everyone. Uh, good to see you. Uh, my name is Lan. I run a venture fund called Basis at Ventures. Uh, we're $140 million fund investing in future work in AI, uh, specifically privacy. Privacy is one of the areas we're super, uh, super excited and interested in. Uh, before this, I, uh, you know, in a similar role as Monty, I was uh, in Corp Dev at Drawbox and you know, excited to chat more about, about this too. Hi, everybody. My name is Mickey Reynolds. I'm the executive director and co-founder of an organization called Grid 110. We're an early stage startup and small business accelerator based in Los Angeles. Hi, good day, everyone. And thank you very much for inviting me to join this uh, very special panel with three ladies um, and Monty. Um, I'm a managing director at Lumber Capital. We are an early stage B2B uh, investment firm. We have been around for 30 years and we invest in North America, Israel, Europe, uh, and we are very excited to be here as one of the partners of uh, Octa Ventures. Great. No, thank you. So uh, quite a diverse group of experiences here. Um, excited for the conversation. So, so Alon, why don't we start with you? You mentioned you have an interest in privacy technology. That, that's been just a hot area over the past couple of years. Um, it's close to identity. We're hearing about it from our customers. So what, from your perspective, is like what consumer enterprise interest has really sparked this trend? Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been pretty fascinating if you think about it. Um, so initially, uh, at least maybe 10 years ago when I was uh, in Dropbox, uh, companies are going to cloud. Uh, now, uh, everyone, probably in the next five to 10 years, everything will be in the cloud. So the apps are getting more connected and the, uh, they're just massive amount of data. Each company use, uses uh, you know, hundreds of, of data. So the sheer amount of data and usage, especially driven by COVID, for each company, for each individual, has just like completely exploded. Um, at the same time, uh, regulations have been uh, more strict than ever. Uh, there's CCPA, there's uh, GDPR, and each state now, uh, you know, Virginia just launched their privacy law. Uh, so I think it's a matter of time when uh, there's just a federal policy about uh, compliance and, and privacy. So driven by the trend of explosion, explosion of data, at the same time, regulation, uh, you know, kind of sparked a lot of company trying to make this easy. Uh, one of our uh, colleagues, must have been uh, Monty uh, Data Grill. They, uh, they're one of the companies that actually uh, just make this super easy for people. Uh, the lead requests or, you know, mapping out your data and um, uh, much more that they can do. Uh, it's just super interesting to see, uh, you know, such trend going toward this direction. Now, you know, there, uh, there's also uh, obviously a downside of uh, such a strict regulation uh, because, uh, you know, if you silo data, it's much less likely we'll be able to run some more co uh, complex machine learning algorithm on top of it. So uh, obviously pros and cons, but, you know, fa personally, I'm very, very fascinated by this trend and think there will be a huge company to be built uh, in this. Yeah, I think it's, it's super interesting. The second order, what you mentioned, just the data element to this and the technologies that are being applied to that data and, and, and the different use cases that are eventually going to evolve from this. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure like from uh, Octa point of view, you're seeing like much more, you know, that's kind of one a core part of your business as well. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, data connected and, uh, you know, getting more and more powerful. Yeah, absolutely. So, so your thought on, on, so we talked about privacy on one hand, on the other hand of that is security and, and security and IT. And there's a lot of, right. you know, in Israel, there's, there's just a lot of trends. You're, you're in front of some of the security trends. Tell us a little bit more about what you're seeing over there as it, as it pertains to IT. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been uh, an amazing year uh, here in the ecosystem. And we are seeing it here, not just in Tel Aviv, but I think it's a worldwide phenomenon. Everything that is uh, related to security, you know, the move from working from home 
in this entire year created a, a huge change in our, the way of behaviors. And then the identity issue and the, uh, uh, the PAM has become a real, real problem that all of us has to uh, have to deal with. And Lan just mentioned the, uh, the data issue. So the data is just the tip of the iceberg because I think uh, the, uh, we cannot reach the data without the identity and the privileged users and working from home, working hybrid, working from the office and, and everything moving to the edge because of this situation created some very, very interesting ideas that we are seeing lately in the Israeli, uh, in the Israeli market, especially from entrepreneurs that are coming from the top uh, elite uh, intelligence units uh, of the Israeli uh, defense forces, joining forces with uh, US-based entrepreneurs and, you, and for the first time also with European entrepreneurs, which is uh, super interesting for us. So this is definitely becoming a global play. Um, and we have seen uh, this uh, uh, trend in one of our joint investment in uh, Hunters, uh, where the uh, XDR is really taking a very significant uh, place in this whole identi identity management and security uh, uh, issue. Yeah, we see it from from the Octa perspective. We we definitely see identity as playing you know the, the control point, as as to yeah. as you mentioned, more of these use cases, more of the technologies move to the edge, and as a result of that, you're seeing a lot of somebody could have an endpoint security, you know, or, or something on the network, but but the policies and, and how you actually would apply that really come from an identity central perspective, and so we are we are immensely interested in and just just. The evolution of some of those trends and and seeing some some new approaches to to operating at the edge um so, so it's fascinating right. from our standpoint and i and i would add to that as well the risk management issue and the appetite for risk uh, from certain organizations um and and we 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 see that this is becoming a really really a big issue so it's not just the identity it's everything that goes with it the regulation that lan just uh, mentioned earlier it will all be combined eventually to one big ecosystem that will have to work together. So the reg tech and the uh, cyber security and the uh, data and the cloud, it's all combined. And we are seeing companies that are offering now platforms and total solution rather than just features in one product. And this is a, a new trend that okay. we are seeing here in the market. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the sense of community. And this is something that, you know, with, each of us have a different different platform from which we are engaging with with startups and and community can mean different things and so, so Mickey I'd love to get your perspective on some of the good work you're doing down in, in, in LA with the regional community and, and how you're approaching that over there sure absolutely so we started grid 110 about six years ago really in an effort to build community uh, to foster a sense of um, collective entrepreneurship amongst founders that were at the beginning idea stages of their business. Um, getting ready to launch, having actually already launched, um, being that connective tissue uh, to connect founders together. Um, it's a lonely process being an entrepreneur, especially if you're a solo founder or even if you have a small team. And so being able to have um, other like-minded individuals that are in similar positions as you are, maybe a few steps ahead, maybe a few steps behind, um, or even more senior to be able to, to talk to you from a mentorship perspective. Um, and so we felt like that didn't seem to really exist, one, in the hyper-local geography that we were focusing on, which was downtown Los Angeles at the time. Um, but over the past few years, it's really grown uh, to be in a more inclusive community uh, amongst founders that come from underrepresented backgrounds. Uh, Los Angeles is about 73% um, identifies as people of color, um, but the startup ecosystem locally and more generally does not reflect that. And so we wanted to build a community where we felt like people have had a sense of identity, that they felt like they could belong, that this was a place for them uh, to support them in their efforts of, of growth um, and not only you know with connecting with mentors and resources and different aspects of the ecosystem but also just connecting them to themselves uh, and to other peer mentorship opportunities of, of connecting with founders um, i know that my personal kind of backstory and in getting involved with grid 110 was i was seeking community at the time uh, and i was looking for something that didn't quite exist and so the opportunity to create something that has become exactly what i was personally looking for and was validated with other individuals uh, to be able to create this you know, fostered sense of community amongst um, other founders uh, i think is really uh, integral to the growth uh, of entrepreneurs 
what are some projects just to, to give the audience some examples that you're, that come out of there? So uh, through Grid 110, we run free accelerator programs. We have a partnership with the mayor's office, uh, Mayor Eric Garcetti here in LA, uh, to provide free mentorship uh, programs, resources to entrepreneurs anywhere from idea to pre-seed stage. Um, and so it's a 12-week program that they run through, uh, includes really uh, structured curriculum, uh, access to office hours, other mentors, and again, that, that sense of community. Uh, we just recently launched an expansion um, focusing on Black and Latinx founders in South Los Angeles. Uh, so again, focusing on underserved communities that don't typically have access to these types of resources or networks uh, in an effort to democratize access and, and helping entrepreneurs grow in their efforts. And what type of problems are they solving? Are they going after enterprise problems, consumer problems, things that are closer, like... All of the above. It's we really see a mix. We see, you know, anything from small business efforts, and so trying to support your your local main street opportunities and and giving resources to the local community, um, to building scalable apps um, from a consumer perspective as well as B two B enterprise. That's awesome. And and Yodfat, going back to you, on the other spectrum for community, there's in Israel, there's this unique public private partnership that exists. Tell us a little bit more how that really works over there. So I think it's part of the, because we are a very small market, even smaller than Los Angeles, I think, in, in the sense of uh, uh, the high tech uh, community, um, I think we are, um, we are vouching one another. So we, we do understand that the small companies cannot really evolve and uh, be successful without the public, uh, public uh, market and vice versa. And since the ecosystem is starting in a very early uh, stage where we teach uh, young kids in elementary school and then in high school about cybersecurity and uh, data and AI, and, AI, and then they, we all have to serve the army as uh, part of our obligatory service uh, for, the, uh, for the IDF, it creates this ecosystem because we meet one another and it's on a national level rather than on a, on a, on a very local, uh, local level. So uh, the, this relationship between private and public starts in a, on a very early day. It's part of this uh, community. So uh, we, uh, we see uh, many multinationals that are coming into the market understanding the uh, advantages that we all know of one another. Uh, at some point, we either we either uh, went to school or to university or to the army. So it's a very, very close and small community. And if we have our first startup, then we meet on the second one or the third one. Or if we fail, then everybody knows that. So we are all striving for uh, a mutual success. And I think this has been uh, working uh, uh, tremendously well. You saw all the SPACs and all the IPOs and the m and transactions in the last six months. It's been almost unbelievable as if we are selling the country. But then again, uh, then again it's, uh, it's been very, very uh, enlightening and, and inspiring for the young generation. So, Miki, I totally get what you're saying. This helps us to bridge gaps between different social economic uh, um, um, uh, communities and societies within our uh, uh, country. And by the way, there might be a great way for cooperation between what you're doing in your acceleration to what we are doing here in Tel Aviv. So we can take it offline later on. Lon, you mentioned you had a background. This is, I mentioned, let's switch gears a little bit. You had a background doing corporate development, M&A at Dropbox before you, trans you transitioned to become an early stage investor. Talk to me about that transition. What principles you took with you to, to help you be successful? Yeah, um, it's very interesting. Dropbox is a, was such a great platform for me. Um, I joined Dropbox in 2013. It was still some of the earliest days. Um, you know, the sheer amount of awesome entrepreneurs I was able to meet on a daily basis when I was Dropbox was just so fascinating, uh, especially this generation of companies uh, going into cloud or, you know, Zoom, uh, Airtable, these are all small back then, you know, 10 years ago. I think just seeing these fantastic entrepreneurs and grow with them and meet them and, uh, you know, uh, exchange ideas and kind of talk to them sometimes uh, for acquisition, that's just the, the network alone at Dropbox would probably the most helpful aspect. Um, I think there are a lot of commonalities 
between uh, M&A and uh, investments. Uh, and a lot of things are also different. I'm curious about your thoughts as well. The similar things I'll mention one, um, which is kind of always, uh, you know, undervalued, uh, which is empathy to, cust- uh, to uh, entrepreneurs. In M&A role, when you're acquiring companies, you're basically buying their babies. <laughs> um, that's really difficult decision. Um, similarly, when making investments, it's also very, very similar. You're investing something they've kind of, uh, you know, grew with their sweat and tears, right? So that's one of the, um, you know, things that people don't really talk a lot about, but I think it's really similar in both roles. Uh, now, there are a lot of differences in, in crypto dev role. You need to align with the company roadmap and structure. You know, what, whatever the company wants to buy, wants to grow, you have to align with that. Uh, this is different, completely different in venture, uh, you know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts, Monty, because you just made a super big acquisition. <laughs> how was how was that? And <laughs> tell us about it. Sure, yeah, we're, we are very excited about the Auth0 acquisition. It still hasn't closed, so I'll just say we're excited about the opportunity in front of us. Um, but to answer your question, the role of M&A and, and partnerships and investing, it's really one of horizons. So, so M&A plays a supporting role to your core strategy, which is, you know, how can you go faster at what you're doing as an organization? Um, how can you, how can you execute on a similar buyer persona? You know, there's different, there's different vectors or lenses to apply there, but it's effectively an extension of your core strategy as a company. Then you have right next to it's your adjacency strategy, which tends to be a partner first motion. Um, and sometimes there could be acquisitions that go into your JCC, but that's primarily a partner first motion. And then there's like a third wave out there, which is something that's probably two JCCs away from you. And, and for us, that could be your transformational strategy or what we call horizon three. That's where investing for us, is, we, we kind of put it in that category. So let's, let's participate in the themes that are emerging, that are exciting to us, that eventually could be really good partnering themes for us. Um, but we want to learn more about it. We feel like we can contribute to it. And so the lens you have to apply, like on a given day, it's, it's like, all right, am I supporting the core strategy of the company? Or am I supporting something that's going to be a few years down the road? And I'm constantly context switching between the two. And, and the, the way you engage in those themes and the tools you have at your disposal, whether it's early stage investing and mentoring, or it's acquiring and doing a transaction, those are just very different. But, but you still have that, that, that common perspective on, you know, ecosystem, uh, being open and friendly to startups, um, and just just non organic growth as a company. So we try to, we try to tie them together, but but we're very sensitive to like the different horizons around them, and that that's how we think about it. Well, yeah, so cool. what else do you in, in this case specifically? Oh, uh, we we just see a big market opportunity for like the the customer identity market, right? Which is slightly you know we we operate in two different markets: workforce identity, which is a lot of what we're describing here with the security, IT, privacy. And the privacy starts to blend over into customer identity. So there's there's a big uh, opportunity there as well. So it's exciting. I can, we can talk about that all day long, but I, I have to be careful because we haven't closed the transaction yet. So um, it was a big deal, though. It was, it was a fun one. Um, okay. I think we talked a little bit about, I'm just, just going down some, some of my notes here. Um, secure, security, something we discussed. Let's let's go back to you, Yodfa. You mentioned early in a previous conversation about some of the some of the technologies you are excited about that are that are becoming enablers of right. security. You know, you mentioned 5G, you know, was contributing to it. Um, you mentioned different tech that's coming out of the military. Which, what, what specific, which ones of those are you the most excited about as you think of it as like a, a new paradigm of which companies and use cases can evolve towards? Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting and, and, and a question. And thank you for that. And I, I think you were spot on with the identity issue. Um, what I think is more important for CISOs, and we are hearing that from most, um, most of them in the last couple of months, is that they're looking for platforms. They're not looking for any more for features or products or interesting uh, tools that will help them to control the SOC, but they're looking for things that will help them to manage all the tools that they have bought in the past. So they're looking for a management platform. And this brings again the question of the identity because the identity has become a key uh, detecting and mitigation security threat since attackers are taking over 
uh, privileged identities and assets of the crown jewels of the uh, of the uh, organization, and you see that on a daily basis in Okta. And the other thing is uh, the PAM, the privileged access management uh, technology that is really rising up because of uh, what Lan has mentioned uh, earlier, the uh, the um, extreme move to uh, to the cloud and the cloud use. And um, I think these two, together with some uh, uh, authentication and authorization technologies can actually help any CISO or CIO in an organization to actually control what is going on in his uh, system and architecture and, and platform. And this is exactly what we are looking for in the security market. I think the XDR market is becoming super interesting. We are seeing few uh, players in this uh, market. Hunters for us is... Uh, uh, of course, the uh, the star, the rising star uh, in this uh, space, and also Automize, another company that we invest in in the identity management um, and uh, the authorization space is uh, super, super interesting. So definitely these are the things that we will be looking for in 2021 and maybe also in 2022, taking into account that the 5G will accelerate all processes. So we don't know exactly where the 5G will take uh, its uh, central role in the uh, in the space. We definitely see a, a significant progress in the U.S. market, less in the Israeli market, and less in Europe. Um, but uh, we are looking forward to uh, look for uh, technologies and look for entrepreneurs that will understand this. Uh, change that will understand this development, and it's more of a revolution than evolution for as long as we understand it. So you're absolutely right. The 5G will accelerate everything and will create a situation where all um, technologies, things that we have been seeing for the last three years will not be relevant anymore. And we will be more of data on the edge rather than just on the uh, cloud. Um, assets, uh, computers, uh, mobile phones, uh, tablets, and will take more responsibility on the data they occur uh, rather than just moving them to the cloud. So if this will be secured, will have to be secured as well. And the amounts uh, um, data um, uh, coverage will also develop new storage um, uh, technologies. Uh, so definitely cloud, 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 identity, and privileged uh, assets uh, management. Yeah, that's a good summary. Let, let's let's shift a little bit towards um, what's happened during COVID, and and you know we we talk about there's been acceleration on just adoption of a lot of these trends and technologies here. I would be curious, Mickey, to get your perspective on what's you know what you're seeing at at the regional level in terms of kind of post post COVID. And, and some of the implications over there. Sure. I remember when the stay-at-home orders first came down, um, and I have a close relationship with the city of Los Angeles. Uh, we're grant-funded through them, and so just the day-to-day -day conversations. Um, it took them, it happened pretty quickly, but it took them a while to all get situated, be able to do all the work that they do typically in you know city hall or in the, the, the city buildings to be able to do that safely and securely from home. So I'd be curious to know kind of like from all of your perspective, if you've seen an increase in terms of an investment in the technology side of enabling companies that you know, had some policies before, but had to double down on those policies because work from home was not a thing that they were really focused around or enabled or supported. And now we're working towards this almost like fully remote or companies are committing to remote. And so what does the investment look like in the technology and the policies um, in the security when people are either working from home or working from an Airbnb halfway around the world? Yeah, we, we I, I can tell you from the Octa perspective, we've definitely seen an increase in adoption for that. If you, if you take a step back, it's 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 enabling your remote workforce. It's from a device perspective, it's supporting managed and unmanaged devices because all of a sudden people are at home and you might have your phones or your you know, your tablets. I want it right in front of me. And, and how do you provide that seamless, you know, productive environment for your employees? And there's always been this healthy tension between like hardened security and user experience. Like, what is the right way to support both? Because these things are constantly at, at odds and and you know we try to support both those, those sides of the spectrum and and with the remote work you know, companies being forced into it and basically you have to break down the, the, the previous governance of like oh you had to go through a vpn or something else before now it's um 
we, we, see, we definitely see an uptick in that. It hasn't been completely smooth, you know, from our customers, and we're trying to help them through that journey. But it's it's been that, that trend is here to stay. We think that's been one of these trends that that really came up, and and people are realizing the benefits. If if you can get comfortable with security for it, people are more productive. Um, and obviously, there's there's industry vertical implications of it as well. But but we're seeing that trend is here to stay. So I, I, I totally agree with uh, what uh, Mickey was saying earlier, but I think this COVID also accelerated few of the uh, technology verticals that we have been seeing gradually growing in the last couple of years. For instance, uh, the HR tech is really booming now um, and is becoming super interesting. Um, the uh, fintech, the whole transformation to digital uh, as I'm also a board member in one of the largest Israeli banks, I see it from, uh, from you know, firsthand. This is really becoming a very, very uh, significant issue, working from home and serving customers from far. Um, uh, the fact that uh, all branches were closed and we were still obliged by the regulator to give full service, you know, accelerated the whole process of transformation and increased involvement with the community. So it created the this both uh, both uh, trends and it was uh, uh, super interesting and the third one that also requires a very very strict identity management uh, software is the digital health this whole privacy issue that relates to banking industry the whole financial industry health tech hr tech while working from home in all environments and uh, and every sector um, really increase the privacy tech or the reg tech as we see it. And um, it will um, require our attention and probably Lani will see it as well, require our attention in the next uh, year or so. Yeah, I completely uh, agree with that. I think it's across all industries and verticals. You see like tailwind driving companies to digital and uh, connect more data and be more secure. Uh, for certain industries, I just want to add that uh, has gone through a complete reset. You know, supply chain, for example, it wasn't like this before. I remember spending uh, weeks uh, in February and March trying to figure out the COVID-95 uh, situation. A complete supply chain has completely reset. Um, you know, um, and, and that I think is really interesting. It kind of, kind of uh, a certain industry has jumped through, you know, uh, maybe multiple years or even a decade of digital transformation went through the end state very, very quickly within a year. Yeah, I just wanted that, which you know, I found fascinating. So what, what, following up on that, what trend are you most excited about that probably didn't exist pre-COVID or now has a spotlight on it post-COVID? So uh, a couple of things. One, um, it's actually the automation of traditional industries. Uh, you know, for example, uh, manufacturing, farming, supply chain logistics, these industries traditionally are very, very, um, you know, not, not, not digital, like to put it mildly. And the, it's a very, very strong uh, r friction of actually uh, bringing them online. But with COVID, they have no choice. Uh, you know, Wilding, for example, the average age of Wilder is 55 years old. You know, there's a massive labor uh, shortage. Uh, at the same time, they can't go to work. And uh, so that actually drove a lot of super strong uh, transformation in those industries. Uh, at the same time, office workers, it's been never easier to just work from home. Like you're seeing dev tools, open source, bottom up adoption uh, company. We've, we've done so many dev tool uh, deals in the past year or so. Everyone's like, you know, going open uh, uh, product driven, product led growth, uh, because that's just, you know, how community as uh, we're talking about community before, that's how things are built. That's how things grow. Right. So that's another massive trend. Um, on top of that, people are getting more comfortable with uh, staying at home and spending uh, their money uh, digitally. So you're seeing like retail transformation, uh, you know, the penetration has, has been uh, more, more than ever. Um, obviously, there are a lot of like smaller business suffering and not doing well. Um, so the market is consolidating across larger players and more, uh, more digital and well-funded players. It's, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, stock market is a different story. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I find the whole past year uh, very, very fascinating. Yeah, Mickey, same question for you. I, I guess it's, it's, it's pre, you know, which area are you, do you see the most opportunity, but also equally the most concern post-COVID? 
I think the area that I've seen that uh, has gotten a lot more attention, and Yodfat kind of mentioned this, is on HR and like employee health and well-being. Um, you know, you, you can no longer offer kind of like the typical company perks that you used to in terms of, you know, free food and the things that were on-site amenities. Um, you're having to transfer that uh, into opportunities that people can just enhance their life at home or wherever they might be working from. But that could include, you know, flexible work policies that could include focusing on more just team building and camaraderie because we, you know, we're more connected than ever digitally, but we are the least connected when it comes to kind of like this physical, you know, more intimate uh, connectivity that we often need um, just from like a human perspective. And so it's been interesting to see the rise in companies that have done well or have, have taken um, the opportunity to create something because of the gaps that currently exist um, to be able to provide this connective tissue. So whether that's platforms um, uh, that are you know, doing digital conferences or um, interactive kind of icebreaker type things, um, team building initiatives, um, whatever it might be, I think there's a, a huge opportunity in that. And then we've even seen on top of the existing platforms like Zoom, there is a whole marketplace that was built for integrations and applications. Um, so again, reaching people where they're at uh, and, and trying to, to create some sense of a bridge between the world that we used to know and, and the world that we know now. Do, do, you, do you have any, on the team building camaraderie, that's just like a perpetual challenge I always think about as well with the organization. Do, do you have any services or unique unique you know, offerings you've seen in that space? Yeah, there's a, a company that I just came across a couple of months ago called Seshi. Um, and they basically kind of like the Airbnb, online Airbnb experiences for team building and employee wellness. Um, so it could be, you know, a casino night. Um, I think that they've actually found a way to do an escape room with like 50 people using Zoom rooms. Um, and so that's kind of the tip of the iceberg of what they're focusing on and just connecting teams together. But they can also provide professional development um, if you need a experienced, you know, DEI speaker, which in the past year, I think has exploded as a career field of, of its own, um, and really being able to connect you with, you know, high quality vetted uh, practitioners, uh, vendors, people that can provide you with the experiences and, you know, the gaps that you have uh, for making sure that your employees feel supported, um, connected, um, and also empowered to do the work that they're doing. That's great. No, it's, I'm literally taking notes. It's perfect. <laughs> A, a real struggle is childcare. I just realized uh, you've had told me she has six kids. I don't know how you do that. That's that's a real. I don't think there's a good solution for it. At least you know we have two kids and we struggle. I know like your family has some tips for us. <laughs> yeah, always keep them busy. That's the only tip that I have. <laughs> yeah, but you know, Mickey, uh, we we found out that during this year, there was a very big difference between entrepreneurs that uh, experienced the last crisis in uh, 2008 and then the young entrepreneurs in terms of how to manage a team in crisis uh, uh, times. And the team buildup was uh, also uh, uh, infected um, uh, by, by that uh, previous experience as well. So you have, uh, we have witnessed uh, entrepreneurs that from day one, decided that every week they're going to send a small package to their employees with some, you know, amenities or goodies just to make them feel good. Although, uh, despite the fact that they're working from home with all the kids and, and uh, the noises and the animals and everything that was going on um, uh, that interfered with, uh, with their work uh, um, tasks. And it actually worked. We, we see today after one year that companies that really invested in their employees and, and talk, the CEO talked to them and send them things and involve them in, in processes in the company, although they were working from home, there was less churn than other uh, companies that were just, you know, keeping their KPIs and there were no uh, team activities. So I think that what you were saying really proved itself among our 75 portfolio companies. We can really differentiate between those who actually did some team, uh, team you know, bonding and, and activities during this year and the others that did not. And uh, it's super fascinating. Yeah. So final question I, I, I would pose to each of you. We've, we've talked about the community. We've talked about the difference in different technology trends here. And we, we started tipping, you know, getting into like em, employee productivity a little bit. How has your relationship, each of you, changed with your either existing portfolio companies as a result of this? Because it's harder to, to manage that, or or even the newer ones, right? How do you develop those you know, newer startups you want to get close to 
when you're in a COVID remote, remote first environment. So I'd love to get each of your perspectives on that. We'll start with Lon. Uh, we've been doing deals remote since uh, the start of the fund. So that hasn't really changed uh, too much. I actually think meeting founders remotely over Zoom is more efficient in, in many ways. And then you spend time with them after you actually get to a certain stage. Um, I think uh, portfolio company support has fundamentally changed. Uh, we went from uh, doing a lot of events in person to doing a lot of text messaging. I mean, we're always doing a lot of text messaging, but more so than ever and virtual events. And uh, we went from uh, lots of like private dinners to actually sent uh, people COVID testing in February and like and by masks and uh, some uh, some company, uh, you know, took our tables uh, fr from the office. No one was in the office. So I think it just, you know, whatever they need, <laughs> what we'll give them uh, in this day and age. So that has become uh, different and quite interesting. Um, and, and speaking of childcare, we're actually actively trying to help them take care of the, you know, figure out a way to do that. We opened up the office with a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, child play area so people can take their kids and actually play and work at the same time. These things, I think, spe uh, special time asks for special solutions and we try to like try to help them uh, solve those solutions. Um, our, it, it's really interesting while we're seeing all these challenges. Uh, the number of companies uh, you know we're seeing is historically high. I think a lot of com uh, entrepreneurs realize this is uh, probably the time to really like uh, you know start a company and uh, go into the area they're really passionate about. So last quarter alone, we saw over nine thousand deals. Wow, Mickey. Yeah, very similarly. So we uh, we've run programs for six years in person. Um, so meeting weekly. Um, there's a lot of just organic again community that gets built just by meeting in person. You know, coming in before sessions, working out of the same office space, being able to have lunch or dinners together. Um, those those conversations and relationships that develop are sometimes hard to translate uh, organically through a digital platform. Um, but I think the thing that we have seen in running digital programs for essentially now the past year um, and have run four programs consecutively is that uh, we've made the programming more accessible for people. So you know if you're familiar with Los Angeles, it can be really difficult to commute, especially for an evening program. Um, and so trying to commute parking, um, we have a lot of parents in our program, so trying to find childcare, uh, as was brought up earlier, can be difficult you know in the normal world um, but because we were able to essentially meet people where they were through you know digital platforms using zoom um, everybody was home, at home isolating anyways um, I think from an accessibility standpoint it made it easier for people to participate there was less stress around finding the time um, and, and making the effort uh, and just having to log on from wherever you might be um, We've tried to implement different things around the community building aspect, again, making it more accessible for people. So running more virtual types of programs more frequently, but even being able to connect them with entrepreneurs or really incredible guest speakers that might have been harder to do before because they either weren't in Los Angeles, uh, it was hard to schedule with their time. Um, and now we can get you know people from really incredible brands talking about different aspects of the brand building, um, fundraising, um, different aspects of, of that. Um, it's much easier to get them to you know come onto a Zoom call and connect with our founders uh, digitally that way. Um, so I think from you know being able to think about where we can take this moving forward, we're looking at expansion opportunities. You know now that there is no geographic you know kind of restrictions, um, having become really comfortable with virtual programming. So we're looking to do. Do, uh, more opportunities where we can expand our programming outside of the Los Angeles area because of the digital meeting medium that we've become comfortable with. That's fantastic. And your thought? Yeah, why well, you you were extremely busy this year? Um, so uh, we I, I would not repeat uh, some of the things that Mickey and uh, Lan were saying, but two things that I would like to. Uh, just to emphasize that really grew this year is we started an HR forum of all the HR executives of our portfolio companies that met uh, at the beginning of uh, the pandemic every week. And we brought uh, legal advisors and psychologists and organizational consultants and people that could actually teach them what crisis is and how to manage the crisis and how to manage the employees from far to be the right hand man or woman uh, for their CEO. And they, they grew 
significantly this year. So the HR role in the companies is not just recruiting anymore. It's definitely an executive role that uh, is being uh, extremely valued by the CEOs and the boards. And this is something that we have developed this year. And the other thing is that we understood that most of the CEOs and the CIOs of the large companies, mostly in the U.S., are, have more time. So we arrange one-on-one discussions and one-on-one meetings on Zoom with the CEOs of our young portfolio company just to expedite the sales process. They were At the beginning, they were terrified. They were simply stuck. How are we going to sell? They were, they're used to travel you know, three weeks a month uh, to the US, to Europe, to the Far East, and suddenly they could not travel anywhere. So the one-on-one interactions on Zoom were extremely helpful. Um, we were very busy with fundraising for our uh, 11 new companies that we invested this year and uh, 17 follow-on company uh, investment that we did with the existing uh, portfolio companies. So the Zoom and the, the uh, distance uh, remote uh, communication with our team members in the U.S. is not something that is new to us, but investing in companies that we don't meet face-to-face was extremely a uh, new experience, and I think it worked really, really well. What we have learned is that the due diligence process, while you invest uh, uh, remotely, uh, is different. We invest much more time in learning about the people from their peers, uh, colleagues, and, and, and others. So the due diligence process changed, and the kind of services, added value services that we give our portfolio company also uh, evolved and developed this year. Well, great. I think you know we're up against time. This has been fantastic, and and hopefully we get to do it next time in person. But thank you all for your time and, and jumping on a, a video chat here. This was great.